all age, and we know that, and everything, all animals seem to age. And um, for many, many years, it was thought that aging was something that was just inevitable. It's like death and taxes. It's just, you know, you, maybe you could exercise, eat a little better, but, you know, not much, there wasn't really much to do about it. Um, but when you look around in nature, what you see is amazing. You see that different kinds of animals can have really, truly, remarkably different lifespans. So here you see the bat, which can live 40 or 50 years, and a mouse lives two years. And yet there are mammals, they're about the same size, and so forth. So clearly, we know that these animals are different from one another because they have different genes. That's what makes them different. That tells you right off the bat that genes have a, can have a big effect on lifespan. So this, you know, this kind of thinking made my lab want to try to find genes for aging. And we, I was really lucky because we worked on a little animal, C. elegans, already. That was, this is an old individual right here, that, um, that lent itself very nicely to studies of aging because um, it has a very short lifespan. And you might think, well, be great to make little C. elegans live longer, but what good is that for people? But the fact is that m even when we started our project about 20 years ago, um, we already knew that many, many genes, some of which were first discovered in C. elegans, that help C. elegans grow and differentiate and behave and all those sorts of things, um, were conserved in people. So we were optimistic. So actually, the way I thought about it was maybe, you know, maybe there was some kind of a, a dial, a regulatory program, some kind of a dial that you could evolutionarily turn up or down. If you turned it up, you would age faster, down you would age slower. But it would be something that would be in all animals. It would be some evolutionary, um, f you know, fundamental conservation here that we could find genetically. So, and of course, if there wasn't, then you could look for mutants. If you didn't find any, you could just stop, and you didn't really waste a lot of time. So we started doing this um, with little C. elegans. Uh, and at the time, there was already a mutant that was reported to live longer than normal. But the problem was this mutant didn't have very many progeny. So it wasn't clear whether the mutation was part of some kind of trade-off between reproduction and longevity. It wasn't really clear. But anyway, so we started looking for long-lived mutants. And really amazingly, we found very quickly after we started um, the most amazing lifespan mutant I think that's ever been found, even to, to date. We found that um, mutations, and I'm giving this talk for people that aren't scientists, so I apologize to those of you who are molecular biologists for not saying, uh, anyway. Mutations that damage a gene called DAF2, that's the name of the gene, could double the lifespan of this little animal. So this is the lifespan profile of a population of normal worms, and you can see that by the end of a month they're all dead. Whereas the mutant is still alive at that time, most of them. And it's not till about, till much longer, twice as long, that they're all dead. So this was really amazing because in these mutants, they have, worms have 20,000 genes, and all but one are normal in this animal. So what are these other 19,000 plus genes that would have, you know, they're still able to work. I mean, they're still able to keep the animal going twice as long as, as normal, even though they themselves weren't mutated. So that was the first the first idea, this idea of disuse, that if a gene isn't used, it would deteriorate. I mean, obviously, these genes were perfectly capable of continuing. And also, just the sheer dramatic effect of, of one single gene on lifespan uh, was really riveting, I, I think. The idea that, and it, this was a gene, obviously, that was doing, probably playing some regulatory role in the, in the regulation of lifespan. So now what I want to do, obviously, of course, what you might be thinking is, yeah, but are these happy worms? And um, that's a really good question. How do you tell? Well, <laughs> you just look at them and you just try to figure it out. So basically, they look, they look very good. And I'll show you a movie of that. But before I show you the movie, I just want to say, usually when you hear about you know, some life extension um, perturbation, someone tells you about it or you hear about it, this is what you think. You think, ah, these people are you know, they're getting older, but look at them. They look really healthy but they don't look really younger than they are. They just look healthy. But what I'm gonna tell you, this mutant is different from that. It's fundamentally different. This is a case where a mutant that sh an animal that should look like this, should be this old, is actually this old. So you really have um, a major fundamental reduction in the rate of aging. And people don't get it. They just don't understand this. Even people who know the story, they always think about this. That's what they think about. Because this is not part of the human 
experience. It's completely outside of our experience. That's why whenever I look at this movie, I'm going to show you my, my little hairs stand up. So here's the movie. These are the, our worms. Um, this right here is normal C. elegans when it's young. Beautiful. There it is. OK, so that's just to get you oriented. Here is the long-lived mutant when it's young. And I'm showing you this because I want to show you that these animals do not look sick. In fact, they can be completely fertile. They can have as many progeny as normal. Now, the next little uh, vignette here shows you a normal worm when it's, uh, when it's old, which is just after, a little after two weeks. You see its head here is moving. See there? But otherwise, it's just lying still. And if you look at the little animal with a high-powered microscope, you can see that the tissues are starting to deteriorate in the animal. So it's, it's really aging, and biochemically and molecularly, by lots of criteria. So here is our mutant at the same time. So see, they are looking much younger. They look older than the very young worms I showed you, which were young adults. I showed you at the beginning of the talk. But they don't look anything like those moribund animals that you saw you know, in the previous little vignette. So, so it's really quite remarkable. With one gene change, you've slowed down the rate of aging. Here's a little uh, example that I like to see. Suppose you're single. Let's say you're a single in your like, say, early 40s, and you're dating. And you go out, you meet with someone that you like, and you go out with them. And you're really getting to like them. And you ask them uh, over dinner, how old are you? And they say, well, I'm 80. You know, that's what it's like. You go, oh my god, that's what it's like. So, you know, I don't know if this could ever happen for people, but worms are animals, and it happened for these worms. So, okay, what is DAF2, this magical gene? It encodes a hormone receptor. That was shown in Gary Rufkin's lab at Harvard. Um, so that tells you right off the bat that um, hormones control aging. In fact, if you think about it, hormones are speeding up aging in these animals because the gene changes that we made made the the DAF2 gene, which encodes the DAF2 hormone receptor, shown here, in the long-lived mutant, the gene did not work as well, and the worms live longer. So that means if the, worm, if the gene does work well, the worms live shorter. So the normal role, it's like the Grim Reaper gene. It's making the worm age at a faster rate and die sooner, which is a surprise that a worm would even have a gene like that. OK, so the nice thing, a really great thing about this uh, hormone receptor, besides the fact that it was a hormone receptor, is that it's, it's conserved evolutionarily. It looks a lot like two different hormone receptors that we have, the receptors for insulin and IGF-1. OK, and probably when you hear that, you might think, oh, well, it's all over because insulin's essential. And so is IGF-1, actually. These hormones um, are known uh, are to promote nutrient uptake and uh, food metabolic or metabolic pathways, or in the case of IGF-1, growth. <clears throat> so they are essential genes, and so is the DAF2 gene, the worm, actually. If you completely knock it out, the worms never make it to adulthood. But the thing that we did in our mutant is we didn't knock the gene out. We just made it work a little less well than normal. So it still worked, but not as well as normal. OK, and I think that's the secret. So this, and I'll come back to that in a minute, what, you know, a possible rationale for what's going on here. But of course, the fact that the DAF2 gene was conserved in evolution raised the question of whether maybe in humans or other animals, um, these insulin or IGF-1 receptor genes had a third function that had never been suspected or discovered to control the rate of aging. So in other words, could this little worm lead us people to the fountain of youth? Is this possible? And actually, I, I don't know, but it's looking good. Um, OK, so first of all, um, many people who work on other animals had either already made mutations in the IGF-1 or insulin receptor or then made them, or they made mutations in upstream or downstream genes in the pathway. And they found that um, mutating the insulin or IGF-1 receptors, the DAF2 genes, could extend the lifespans of fruit flies and mice. And recently, it was shown that um, bats, the, the bat genome was sequenced. And it turns out that the IGF-1 receptor gene, the bat DAF2 gene, is, um, is riddled with mutations. And so is the growth hormone receptor gene, which is upstream, which controls the production of IGF-1 in the, in the mouse. That gene, I mean, sorry, in the bat, well, in all animals. So that gene is also screwed up genetically in the, in the bat. And the bats live for 40 years. So that suggests, uh, it doesn't prove it, and it's, I don't know if it can be proven, really. But it really suggests that, um, that changing these genes 
in evolution help to uh, drive the evolution of very long-lived animals, which is really, really exciting to tie laboratory findings to nature and to evolution like this.